Welcome to SpacePod with Paul Russell and Paul Gatland of IBM. So today it's a great privilege to have Mike Begemby, founder of Lens.ai, an author, and may I say, Mike, a huge influence on how the Just Giving organization came to prominence. Thank you, Paul. So we need to say before we get started that this is neither an official podcast on behalf of IBM or on behalf of Mike's organization. So Mike and I first met at a co-founders group called Data Journeys, which is a real open group of people who are exploring the role of data and actually what is the journey to an outcome. So my first question is to really learn a little bit more about your mindset when that happened and what you were looking at in terms of a problem statement back then. But also fast forward to the world that we're in, in IBM and also technology companies around workspace. What do you see, whether similarities or differences, about how we use code to change people's behavior? Zareen and Anne-Marie had basically said, look, we have a lot of data. There must be something we can do with it. And, and by a lot of data, I'll give you a bit more context on what that was. They had millions of records of people raising money for causes by doing specific activities and other people donating to them. But the, the way it used to work at Just Giving was typically, I wanted to raise money for a charity and I would decide to run the marathon or do the London to Brighton cycle ride or even do something a bit more extra like we had people sitting in a bathtub full of beans but, you know people were doing interesting things for causes that they were passionate about we found that there was actually a really strong signal within the data in being able to understand what people were what they cared about and more importantly what they cared about but also how they showed what they cared about giving those example those events as uh, different examples what got us really excited is that we suddenly found that we had the ability to match people and causes and a cause could be directly a charity, or it could be someone doing something extraordinary for a cause that you're passionate about. We learned so much about human behavior there, um, particularly when it comes to data, particularly when it comes to their relationship with charities and their relationship with how things that they care about. So I'll give you a quick example. Where before I became a parent, children's charities weren't in my forefront. Actually, the charities that I paid a lot of attention to were cancer-related charities because of uh, what my grandfather um, uh, suffered and people that were close to me having had to deal with cancer. But the moment I became a parent, my sort of caring dial shifted a little bit and I became really passionate about anything that had to do with children. And what was so interesting is that the data showed us some of these changes and some of these behaviors. So it was a really exciting time. And you called it uh, the Just Giving algorithm, but actually it was a suite of algorithms that allowed us to match people with causes that they were passionate about problem statement in our world, which is using data, create new experiences. But those experiences are probably there before anyway. We as human, we really value our experiences, but we have very poor memory. I think when you jump onto behavioral economics, they will show you that our, our memory is always skewed and often biased. So whilst the experience is important, the unit in which we store those memories is designed to favor and to help us survive, which means we may tailor them accordingly. And that often means that when we rely too much on that memory, our judgment, our understanding of the past and our judgment of present is typically incorrect. And data helps solve that problem. Mike, Paul told me this story uh, around the just, yeah, the early days of the just giving algorithm. There was uh, an unintended outcome uh, involving middle-aged white men and bicycles. Yeah, no, that was that was a really important lesson for us. The lesson that that taught us was the importance of human domain. So uh, I'll take a step back to explain what it was we were doing. We uh, had discovered that the image that you choose when you're, fun when you're creating a fundraising page, raising money for a cause that you're passionate about, you get a choice of putting uh, a picture on there. And the image that people were using had a strong relationship with the amount that they eventually raised. So we thought, okay, great, let's give this to the machine and see if the machine can work out what sort of image should you put on your fundraising page to maximize the amount that you can raise for the charity that you care about? Immediately, the machine said, bicycles. Everyone should put a bicycle on. And at first, we were like, what? That just doesn't make any sense. And the machine was very clear. And in all its tests, it was like, you put a picture of a bicycle, you will raise a lot of money. Now, because we had some additional domain knowledge, we knew exactly what that was. And it meant that we had to control for event type which we hadn't before. And the pages that raise the most money on Just Giving are typically cycling events. And they're cycling events that are run by middle-aged white men who at some point worked in the city and have very large networks. And they all seem to be of that particular demographic. And, and you can see this quite neatly on the Just Giving in the data, actually, that uh, most of those individuals that raised a lot through a cycling event uh, just behave that way. 
But that was where the machine, there's a danger of letting the machine just learn from the available data. We have a responsibility to make sure that we are teaching it correctly. It's the same way when we teach children history, I think we have a responsibility to teach the truth and teach the right history because it has a corresponding impact on, on the outcome and our behavior later. But in this case, when we were teaching the machine, we just literally gave it the data and we didn't give it any more guidance that um, some events are over-indexed by a particular type of individual, which is why they would raise more. And actually it's less likely to be because of the image, but more likely to be because of the person in their network. So that's, that's the story behind that. Pick up on something, because my next question about your career Accenture, De Beers, Just Giving, Lens.ai. But I read an article in Forbes recently that your interest in this, in this debate, this discussion, goes way back to when you were a, a young child. And firstly, is that true or false? It is true. This started from when I was a child. It's, uh, I, I would almost say it's almost inevitable. So on, on my mother's side, uh, my, my grandfather is a, a psychiatrist. And um, every time we went to his house, he had models of brains, uh, pictures of brains. He was just very much into both psychiatry and psychology, actually. So, um, and, and quite a bit of philosophy as well, actually, which is uh, all the P's, um, a very interesting combination. And then on my dad's side, my father is an economist, you know, viewing the world or people as econs at both a macro and a micro level is, is very, very fascinating. So he used to build a lot of computer models which left the computer there for me to gain an interest in. And uh, naturally, I, I, I you know, leaned towards the computer. But what I did find from a very early age, because the first, the first game that I wrote was, uh, um, I got it from Reader's Digest, actually, that my mother had left lying around. And it was one of, one of those things that could predict you know, your age or something like that, one of those quizzes that you took. Um, and all I did was code the quiz into a small uh, basic program. And uh, uh, people would look at me in amazement, but I had literally copied the game from, I'd copied the, the text from somewhere else. But I did become really fascinated in to how it worked and how it played on a lot of biases that we have as human beings, because I knew at that stage immediately that the machine only learned that from me. I taught the machine that. But there was other knowledge that existed elsewhere around how the brain worked and how we as humans ended up you know, responding to certain things. And so inevitably I became very, very fascinated about both of those, those worlds. Um, so you then asked, how does that sort of transpose itself to industry? And uh, um, what I w did learn, and I could see this throughout my career, is that in many organizations, and I, I wonder if it's changed now, particularly those that are working with consumers, I was fascinated by how many did not take into account behavioral economics as a discipline, you know, uh, trying to understand how we as humans are irrational, um, predictably, in our decision making. Um, De Beers itself actually were, were fascinating in that. I actually think they, they spent a lot of time, they had a, an army of people in Hollywood, you know, understanding how to put things in movies. And even the whole concept of a diamond as an engagement ring, I believe, was created by them. Uh, it didn't work in every country and in other countries they created other moments in your life by uh, where you should be giving someone a diamond and then very humbly left it as oh it's just a culture a tradition but it was something totally made up by them you know uh, so they spent a lot of time in that but a lot of commercial organizations that work in the technical space seem to leave out the discipline of behavioral economics and i think that's the big mistake the power is when you merge the two yeah that's that example and, and um, there's, there's going to be many many more you know the machine was not at fault so the machine did what it was asked to do so during that process of you know taking data apply asking the machine to look at it and getting the machine to tell you what it sees if, we, if it was a maturity curve of zero to ten in terms of getting that bit right in terms of applying trustworthiness to what the machine's saying where would you put the industry yeah and you know what i'm going to be controversial here and say the industry on a scale of one to ten ten being they're they're right there where they need to be the industry is at two you have to remember that Human beings, we learn from experience. Machines learn from data. But that data is coded experience. So there's two things that are going on here. Number one, the experiences that are coded might already have a biased view of the world. And so uh, take, for example, you're trying to hire uh, someone to be a developer at, at Amazon. And you take all the historical data of all the previous developers at Amazon. 
and say the tell the machine, all right, find out what the best developer should look like. And the machine says, okay, they need to be white, long, dark hair, and listen to death metal. Inevitably, the machine will then penalize any CV, that's a CV of a woman or a CV of a person of color. Now, this isn't to say that the machine was coded poorly, but the, the historical data wasn't representative of, I mean, it was representative of what was taking place, but it didn't uh, sort of address the problem in the system to begin with. All we have done now is mechanized that problem right and removed it away from from our responsibility so and, and why does the industry why do i blame the industry on that it's um okay so the industry therefore needs to be aware that the data that we have may not be fully correct so we have to be really careful about what the machine tells us i'll give you a quick example um there was a in the us i can't remember which state it was um had an algorithm to try and understand uh, whether certain shops were being fraudulent with food stamps, right? The way that food stamps were used to um, collect uh, uh, or to be, uh, would you say, traded in for food? I, I don't know the, the exact terminology, but um, it was uh, food stamps. The machine pointed out three Somalian stores or several Somalian stores, Somalian owned stores. Basically, it said that, oh, there's definitely fraudulent activity there because there were a large amount of food stamp being cashed at one particular time making these guys potentially quite wealthy. What they failed to understand was, you know, that the historical data used to train that was used on all the normal stores. But the behavior of the Somalian community is very different to the behavior of uh, other people in the US. So that should have been a flag, but it, it, in fact, it came down and they shut the stores. And that was very impactful to that community. It had large corresponding impacts because if you imagine this is a culture that eats a specific type of culture, but they, 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 a specific type of food, but also their shopping habits are very community based and they all happen at one go, you know, um, and so they would gather all their food stamps and do it all together. And one person might go and take food stamps for six families, say, for example. Now this would flag in the database as fraudulent activity, but that's because it was taught based on a very narrow set of data. Um, and so that's where I say that the, the industry must sort of be aware of the data that we have is not fully representative of human behavior as a whole. It's representative of perhaps portions of behavior. The second part that the industry is lacking on is just diversity in the people who are writing the algorithm. Why that's important is because they would probably make the same mistake with the data. They are more likely to catch it when they do the testing. At the moment when we test an algorithm, we typically test it for accuracy. How many times out of 100 did it get the answer right and we also tested for things like precision and recall which is how many false positives and false negatives did we get and that really depends on the situation so for example if you think of um, uh, uh, a virus false negative is actually really really important because it means you might be releasing someone into the population that would spread the virus so you don't want any false negatives but equally you can have some another instance where you have a false positive that has also detrimental effects because it may result in someone again take a, a virus example but it may result in someone thinking that they have a condition when they don't and get depressed and so forth and all the ramifications so why you need a diverse group of people working on the algorithms is because they know these idioms that haven't been captured in the data just yet. And therefore, they can address them. But the industry is lacking in both full data sets and diverse people to write the algorithms. And so we're still a way behind in fully trusting all of the algorithms. And, and it can have some detrimental effects, particularly when something has been put into production. You know, with everyone on a smartphone, you know, the Western sides of the world at least, you know, I wondered about your thoughts on how, you know, we're going to use machine learning uh, to empower the device to help us more, you know, navigate through the workplace. And, uh, you know, I'm being literal here, uh, given there's a big debate about office versus home. When you say navigate through the workspace, it's interesting. This is where you get a bit of exposure into my mind. I'm, I'm quite a visual person. So when you say that, I actually imagine someone walking around a building from one aspect it can be someone with a smartphone looking at a floor plan uh, trying to get from a to b or it could be you know how do i navigate through a certain process uh, you know within that workspace so uh, yeah again i was just yeah really i guess you can take take the question in, in any sort of context mike I, I wonder if the phone is inevitably becoming the real, you know, they always talk about the digital representation of yourself, right? 
And we often talk about it as this thing that exists somewhere on, on, in the ether. But I wonder if the phone is that, you know, the phone is the real digital representation of ourselves. It goes with us everywhere, but it's the thing that captures the data, stores the data, and also delivers the data around what we do, um, potentially around what we feel nowadays, you know, depending on what we write or what we say to other people. But as a real digital expression of who we are, I do wonder if that is all there within the phone. And then you can translate that into how you navigate your, your either physical workspace or how you even navigate your, 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 your job, you know, it's a, or even your home, because separation from your phone may, may mean that data can't really help you in that, whereas if your phone is still connected to you it's, uh, or, or with you, it suddenly interferes with your behavior somehow. I just wonder if there's something in that space about the phone actually being our, our own digital representation of us. I, 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 as, as you were saying that, Mike, I, I just had this thought about if someone actually said to me, you can either lose your laptop or your phone. I think I'd lose the laptop just because, you know, if the phone, if the doorbell rings, it pings up on my phone. Uh, if I want to see who's at the front door, you know, I can actually see that using the phone as well as the, all the usual stuff of emails and, and that sort of thing. You know, I can even control my you know the heating in the house through the phone now the pace of change inside smart buildings there's millions of mini problem statements that occur daily in our world the shortage of data is not the problem it's that understanding what the problem statement was at the start and then making sure that you focus on the outcome as opposed to just the result i think that's a really good point actually it's the the implementation of the results so in in the world of ai and data science i would say one of the big challenges isn't, let's say, finding a PhD who can write you a great algorithm and show you the, an outcome or a result. It's the productionizing of that code. And by productionizing, I mean, how do you put it into practice so that it plays a part in the decision and in the activities of us as human beings? It's all good having a result which, an appear, which appears in an academic paper or which you see in a dashboard. But I really think that the best use of, of, of that, particularly when it comes to even things like smart buildings, is how is it productionized and implemented in such a way that it contributes or influences the decisions that we're making for that respective goal? Any organization that I work with or, or anybody who's doing anything with an algorithm that is centered around human behavior, there's three uh, sort of core elements of data that I always look at. And that's the events or the things, the events or the actions that the person is doing. Um, the geolocation and geo timestamps, so when they did that event and where they were, and the environmental data, which could be anything from the weather through to the mood of the country at the time of the location that they're in. With those three categories of data, you do effectively have a laboratory of human behavior, um, and you have a laboratory of that individual's behavior. And the more that we have this conversation, the more I'm beginning to see how much the phone is capturing all of that by default. You know, so it knows exactly where we are. Even if you have the, you know, the, any of the navigation apps turned off, your phone is connecting to Wi-Fi every time. It's attempting to do so. And the list of every Wi-Fi that it has attempted to connect with is stored in the phone. So it always knows where we are at any particular time. Uh, environmental data as well, from the weather through to, you know, use all of that sentiment. Um, there's just so much the phone is capturing those three core pieces of data which means that it is by itself even if we just extract it's always learning but it's not making use of it you know and and that data is there for us to to learn so much about people and i'll give you another example i remember doing some research and came across an organization called the black dog institute and this is the organization i've mentioned it this to you before paul where they um, were working with the uh, veterans coming back from uh, Afghanistan, soldiers coming back from Afghanistan, who had a very high propensity to commit suicide and suffer from mental illness. But using the phone, um, and they did put a specific app on the phone, but the app was uh, capturing a range of things from the people they were communicating with, with the frequency of communication and, and their movements. But through that app and the data that they were collecting, they managed to get to the stage where they could predict the onset of mental illness but they could also you know and therefore prevent suicide rather than deal with it afterwards which of course from a monetary perspective had significant uh you know savings that they could have um that they could make and the interesting thing that they found was the distance that an individual moved from their house was a really strong predictor on how likely they were to suffer from mental illness so the the, the more that that shrunk 
the more likely that that particular individual was going to end up mentally ill. And that, that says a lot for COVID, if you, if you can imagine that. We weren't moving very far from our houses. So I do wonder what that's done for mental illness as a whole. You know, I, I'm wondering if data and the analyses of data can, you know, help in the journey of getting to the workplace because you know I, I think most of us feel that actually once we're at the workplace our employer is going to do all they can to keep us safe but my 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 personal concern is getting from my house to the office and i'm just wondering if there's any data analyses that would help in that process because I, th I think we're missing a lot of data from there and you know what one of the things that i think COVID has done is accelerated digital transformation or what's the acronym I, I came up with the other day K Ada, covid accelerated digital automate di digitization and automation covid accelerated digitization and automation yeah so that's the world we're in right now people have had to i think gabe said it the other day jumped five years worth of digital digital transformation in in two weeks uh, and automation is happening right now as well where i've seen a huge uptake in uh people trying to learn about um rpa robotic processing and automation primarily because they're sitting there saying we need to continue to produce and i can't rely on the human um so uh it, it's it's really important that we start capturing a wider set of data because it's actually still quite narrow digital twin in other industries for us you know manufacturing automotive aerospace great examples of where you can create a digital representation of the physical when you then move into the loosely coupled buildings and people and their journey to work and uh, you know all those events are very analog in one respect the, the complexity goes through the roof and yet we're still trying to use the same type of thinking in the manufacturing world to say if i can manufacture a car like a tesla surely i can manufacture a building that gives you the best possible digital experience no not necessarily <laughs> i think is the general gist of the industry and maybe we're looking in the wrong area but there is there is a fantastic point that you've made there and that we particularly working with technology trying to make things smart forgetting the human is the biggest mistake and and the human is is actually a bit more complex than we should, we give it credit you know and, and uh, i think uh, when you accept that degree of, would you call it, I think in scientific terms, we would call it, um, okay, it's the difference between randomness and chaos. And, and chaos being the fact that actually um, everything is predictable, but you need to know every single variable, right? And, and randomness is true randomness. You have no idea what will happen next. Whereas, um, and I think with, with humans, there's a good degree of chaos where the danger is most of the data that we've captured is imperfect. We don't have all of the data and therefore you can't really get a true sense of what to do and what not to do. So we can't forget the human because the, the, the example that someone gave me one time is we often think that with machines, we're replicating the five senses. You know, they can hear, they can see, they, but scientists have now found 21 senses, right? With within human, you know so how do you replicate those how do you replicate the sense where if you close your eyes you can still touch your nose without knowing the the coordinates of that you know and that's not that's not any of the five senses but it's a sense of knowing where parts of your body is or are without even being able to look mike you know, it, was, it was an absolute pleasure today and uh, i really, really enjoyed talking to you and it's just a pity we, we, we didn't have more time mike so a huge thank you for your passion and attention today on space pod paul a big thank you to you of course and to people who've listened if you liked it please tell others you've been listening to space pod please stay safe